It is amazing and intellectually incomprehensible how the later followers of Muhammad attributed to him, among other stunning characteristics, the dogma of sinlessness, contrary to their Quran that asserts otherwise. Will you enlighten us? Throughout the Muhammadan world of today, it is believed that all of the prophets enjoyed Isma, that is, a divine protection against error, and that they were accordingly sinless. This is another one of the anomalies and mendacities of Muhammadan Islam that this doctrine has been established and maintained against the very clear statements of the Quran and Hadith to the contrary. Muhammadan orthodoxy asserts that no prophet commits sin and hence is sinless, ma'asum. Unfortunately, this dogma contradicts various crystal clear statements of the Quran and of Muhammad as recorded in the traditions. I shall demonstrate that both the major sources of Muhammadan Islam teach that all the prophets accepting Jesus had sins of which they needed to repent and seek forgiveness. In the early centuries of Muhammadan Islam, however, a doctrine founded on popular sentiment and theological presuppositions arose and developed away from the teachings of the Quran and Hadith. It was first formulated in the creed known as the Fiqh al-Akbar, and it is there stated, all the prophets are exempt from sins, both light and grave, from unbelief and sordid deeds, yet stumbling and mistakes may happen on their part. However, it was not possible to defy the written sources of Muhammad and Islam entirely, and so the records of the sins of the prophets in the Quran and Hadith were deliberately watered down into mistakes. Similar euphemisms such as acts of forgetfulness are constantly used by the Muhammadan writers today to account for these misdemeanors which the scripture and traditions of Muhammadan Islam clearly demonstrate. It became almost a mandatory rule that blameworthy behavior of the prophets is smoothed over by means of all possible linguistic subterfuge. There are basically two reasons for the rise of this doctrine in Muhammadan Islam. Firstly, the early Muhammadans soon discovered that the Gospels, Injil, taught plainly that Jesus was the only sinless man that ever lived, and confronted with this evidence, deemed it necessary to invent the fiction that all the prophets were sinless as well, and especially Muhammad. The thought that Jesus is superior over Muhammad was anathema that could not be tolerated. Hence, just as hundreds of miracles were manufactured and attributed to the figurehead of Muhammad and Islam, to give him a status at least equal to that of Moses and Jesus, so he was also held to be sinless for exactly the same purpose. Secondly, the doctrine of the revelation in Muhammad and Islam holds that the scriptures were dictated directly to the prophets by the intermediary angel Gabriel. Hence, as a consequence, the prophets had to have possessed an impeccable character, which protected them from error in their personal lives, otherwise they could not have been trusted to communicate Allah's impeccable revelations. This latter presupposition led perforce to the conclusion that the prophets must be sinless. The doctrine of Isma presupposes that the purpose of al nabuwa prophethood, would be defeated if the people to whom they are sent saw the prophets vulnerable to commit sins and tell falsehoods, because then they would also think the same about their teachings, their commands, and their interdictions. Based upon this supposition, Muhammadan orthodoxy therefore drew the logically correct conclusion that the prophets must be regarded as immune from serious error, hence the doctrine of Isma. It was nevertheless a corollary drawn from their own preconceived notion that Allah could not ensure the perfect transmission of his revelations unless he simultaneously preserved his messengers from all possible errors of conduct and character failure. I would like to remind our listeners that according to both the Hebrew Bible and the Quran, all the prophets were sinners. The Isma doctrine in Muhammadan Islam is further weakened by their claim that the Quran has been preserved over the centuries without error. If Allah could entrust the perfect preservation of his revelations to sinful men, why could he not also entrust the transmission of the same revelations directly to them? The doctrine is not only unsound in the light of Quranic teaching, 
but can also hardly be regarded as a logically correct conclusion. Either way, it cannot be tracked back to the teaching of Muhammad himself. The Quran clearly shows that Muhammad was a fallible and sinful creature. The conception of him as the ideal man and prototype of humanity belongs to a much later development. The acceptance of this doctrine, contradictory to the original teachings of the Quran, had moreover a dogmatic motive. It was considered indispensable to elevating the text of the Quran above all suspicion of corruption, which suspicion would not be excluded if the organ of the revelation, Muhammad, were fallible. Ladies and gentlemen, please note that the impeccability of Muhammad is based upon a different foundation than the Christian concept of the sinlessness of Jesus. Muhammad's impeccability is asserted for the purpose of establishing the validity of his revelation, the Quran. Jesus' sinlessness, on the other hand, is the corollary of the affirmation of his divinity and also of the Christian understanding of the true nature of man. Prophetic protection or impeccability, Isma, is a Muhammadan postulate in respect of revelation rather than a description of the quality of Muhammad's persona. Thus, it allows for the euphemisms of so-called mistakes and acts of forgetfulness. This distinction should be borne in mind at all times as we proceed to analyze this Muhammadan doctrine. Not only does the Bible teach that all men have sinned, but it also unreservedly sets forth the grave misdeeds of many of the prophets mentioned in the Quran and records the confessions they have made of their sinfulness. For example, after his adultery with Bathsheba, and the murder of her husband Uriah, David cried out to God, Against thee, thee only have I sinned, and done that which is evil in thy sight. Psalm 51.4 Another prophet, beholding God's glory, declared, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. Job 42.6 Yet another confessed, I will bear the indignation of the Lord, because I have sinned against him. Micah 7.9 very significant to find that the Quran also makes many of the prophets cry out for the forgiveness of their sins. After killing the Egyptian, Moses is said to have prayed, O oh my Lord, I have indeed wronged my soul. Do thou then forgive me. Al-Qasas 28.16 Wise Abraham said of the Lord of the worlds that he was the one who I hope will forgive me my faults, khati'ati, on the day of judgment. Al-Shu'ara 26.82 Despite these clear, plain confessions of sin, Abdullah Yusuf Ali, a very famous translator of the Quran, says in his The Religion of Islam, page 199, It is one thing to commit a mistake and quite a different thing to go against the divine commandments. And no sensible critic could twist such words into a confession of sin. Yet, Abdullah Yusuf Ali, without flinching or batting an eyelid, and with an incredible degree of dishonesty, does exactly this twisting to excuse the inexcusable. The word used for false in Surah Shu'ara 26.82, translated by Ali as mistake, is khati'ati, one of the Quranic words for sin, khata'a. With typical Muhammadan scholarly deception, deliberately mistranslates the word by softening its meaning and saying, this word too has a wide significance and covers all unintended actions and mistakes and errors of judgment. Its mention, therefore, in connection with the Prophet, does not imply sinfulness. He thus, with a forethought, deliberately goes on to mislead his readers. This interpretation is hardly consistent with the usage of the word in the Quran, for it appears in another passage which reads, Because of their sins, Mimma Khati'atihim, they were drowned in the flood and were made to enter the fire of punishment. Nuh 71.25 For sins in this verse is khati'atihim, from the same word used in the Shu'ara 26.82. In this case it is said that the people of Noah's time were drowned in the flood and cast into the fire for such sins. The word is therefore here used for sins which were so grave and so serious that they led to the destruction of those who committed them and their immediate consignment to hell. The suggestion that the word is only used for mistakes and errors of judgment is hardly borne out by its use in a context in the Quran where a grossly defiant rebellion against Allah's laws is under review. One has here a typical proof of the tendency of many Muhammadan writers in their attempts to water down 
the plain meaning of the Quranic words so as to absorb the prophets and hence specifically absolve Muhammad of any and all moral blameworthiness. It's significant that when the Quran speaks of Abraham's prayer for forgiveness of his sins, it chooses exactly the same word that it elsewhere uses to describe some of the worst sins ever committed against Allah. A sincere and honest comparison of these contexts must lead to the conclusion that the Quran acknowledges that the prophets at times sinned directly against Allah's laws and commandments. Furthermore, it is interesting to note that while Ali speaks of Abraham's mistakes in Surah 26.82, he translates the same word as wrongs in the case of Noah's people in Noah 71.25, a clear evidence of an inconsistent Quranic exegesis arising from the cherished presuppositions contrary to his teachings.